All right. Hello, hello, my friends. Today is a very good day. And if you're familiar with this channel, well, then you know why that is. We are going to be talking all about this 1958 356A 1600 Porsche Speedster, which has been in my family for over 30 years. So, you know we are going to have a very good time. Let's do it. of the Porsche family and you're gonna hear me say Porsche or Porsche I'm from South Texas I grew up saying Porsche and that's what I predominantly say I mean nobody's snobs around here say Porsche or Porsche it doesn't really matter the correct pronunciation is Porsche so let's go all the way back to Dr. Ferdinand Porsche now he grew up in a repair shop that his family owned so naturally he became a pretty talented mechanic spent a lot of his time there he would create his first vehicle in 1898, and that was an all-electric powered carriage. Now, back then, batteries were mighty heavy, so he quickly kind of ditched that because the batteries weighed a ton, and he made it actually a hybrid. So that was called the P1. All right, now this is a little interesting tidbit that I like to share because, you know, I'm into this weird history stuff. Okay, so at one point during... Ferdinand Porsche's career, he was actually the chauffeur for Archduke Ferdinand. Franz Ferdinand, pardon me. Yeah, for some of you history buffs, you might have already realized that is the name that is associated as the first domino to start World War I. Now, luckily for uh, Ferdinand Porsche, he was not the chauffeur that took the wrong turn that led to the assassination of the Archduke. After he was a chauffeur, he went on to be the lead director, let's see, was lead director? Director of engineering at uh, Daimler. And there he gained a lot of popularity. Frankly, you could say he was the most popular, well-known, famous engineer in Germany. He produced the Mercedes-Benz SSK, which reached 120 miles per hour, which might not sound like a lot right now, but back then that was and it was the best. The Mercedes-Benz SSK was the pop race car of its era. All right. Now, like I just said, Ferdinand was the most popular engineer in Germany. So whose eyes do you think he caught? That of Adolf Hitler. Well, I could not help but use the Time magazine cover of Adolf Hitler. That was, he was selected Man of the Year in 1941. And is there not a lesson to be learned there? So Hitler promptly recruited Ferdinand. He put him to work on creating the people's car, the Volkswagen. And Hitler's whole idea behind that was to be a, an affordable, lightweight, gas efficient, cheap to produce car that could transport German families around. And that did it, okay? And also, before I forget and jump on to him being in the Nazi party in SS, it has been proven in the court of law that Ferdinand Porsche borrowed a few design ideas from the Czechoslovakian automotive manufacturer, Tatra. All right. Now, I actually have a video that covers the history of Volkswagen and that whole court case doc, you know, documentation with Tatra in there, too. You should check it out. It's kind of interesting. So Ferdinand has joined the Nazi party and then he kind of becomes a member of the SS, which is pretty pretty bad. And then he also designs and creates the elephant tank. And it's for his creation of the elephant tank and for him joining the SS that he is consequently imprisoned for war crimes. That's, that goes on. I think he's in there for four years and he gets out in 1948, just in time for you know what. Yep, during those three years, 
years, because I just checked my notes, it is 1945 that Dr. Porsche goes to prison, all right, for war crimes. And during those three years, his son, Ferry, gets to work creating the first production Porsche. And that would be the 356. Let's interject for one moment and talk about the Type 64, which some other folks do deem that as the first Porsche, all right? They also call it the Nazi Porsche, it was part of the major snafu during uh, Monterey 2019 Car Week that was so funny. Sorry. Sotheby's really blew it on that one. Well, I think we all know I can't help myself. But obviously, 1948, that is the same year that William Lyons debuted the Jaguar XK120 at the Earl's Court Motor Show. And also, I just thought that's important because that puts into perspective the other production vehicles that the 356 was up against. Now what powered the 356 originally was a four-cylinder air-cooled engine. You'd see air-cooled for a long time with Porsche, obviously, um, until the 928. Now, if you wanted the coupe, you could get it just under four grand. If you got the Cabriolet, it would just be a little bit over four grand. Interesting thing to note too, though, is that the 356 was actually $300 more expensive than the Jaguar XK120. And with the 120, you actually got a lot of car. And it went, you got a lot of car with the 120. It also was the fastest production car of its day. So I think that's a testament to how much people actually liked the 356. If it was able to be $300 more expensive than the fastest production car of the time. Neat. Now, a lot of that popularity really came from the fact that you could race the 356 on Sunday and then take it to work on Monday. It garnered a lot of attention at the American SCCA races. And then when it won its class at the 1951 Le Mans, its popularity was set. So another important thing to note was reliability. The 356 was rather reliable and that was during the time period where not a lot of the European sports cars were reliable. That's a major selling point. So, fun fact, maybe 76,000 356s were ever produced, and maybe half of that is still in existence. All right. All right. Let's get to some exciting stuff, shall we? So, it's 1952, and Porsche puts out the American Roadster, a.k.a. the Type 540. Now, that's not the Speedster. But it was certainly the first domino to the Speedster creation. Now, at this point, some of you might be asking, well, why would Porsche come up with something called the American Roadster? Huh? Well, the idea all came from Max Hoffman, who was the sole importer of Porsche into the U.S. He was located in New York, if my little memory is serving me right. Okay. Now, Max told Ferry, he said, there is certainly a market here among Americans for affordable, sporty roadsters. And keep in mind, this was the age, this was the influx of um, sporty European roadsters. All right, you had MG cars, you had Austin Healey, you had Jaguar. It was a good time to be alive, all right? And so Hoffman put this idea into Ferry's head. And what came about was the American Roadster. And now, unfortunately, with the American Roadster, it was just too expensive for them to produce. And why that is, is because the American Roadster's aluminum body was not something they could incorporate into the 356 lineup in Stuttgart. So in my opinion, scarcity is really a fire poker when it comes to classic car collection. And the American Roadster, only 17 were ever produced. Yeah! I actually got to see one at the Amelia Island Concourse earlier this year. And it was pretty pimp. It was the first one for me to ever see. All right, I digress. The American Roadster may have not succeeded, but it certainly planted a seed in Ferry's head. And so he would go back to the drawing board and realize he just needed to shave a little off the top of the 356 and remove a couple of frills, and he's got the Speedster. And now we have finally got to the point in history where we can talk about the Speedster. That's where I've been trying to get this whole time. But, you know, I don't skip out on the history. It's the problem I have. 
All right, let's go ahead and paint a little picture about what the times looked like when Porsche revealed the Speedster. It's 1954, and that is the first year that Elvis puts out a record, and so he's just beginning to enjoy a little stardom. That's also the first year that there were mass vaccinations for polio. That's a big deal. And if you're not familiar with how polio vaccinations came about, well, you have your Rotary Club to thank for that. Also, this is the year that Mercedes-Benz put out their 300 SL with the iconic gold wing doors. And also, this was the last production year. 1954 was the last production year for the Jaguar XK120. From 1948 to 1954. All right, guys, so like I said, Speedster is a no-frills 356. Let's get on in here. I'm about to show you just how absolutely spartan the cab is, okay? You have your bucket seats. The instrument cluster is mighty sparse and a removable windscreen. So let's go ahead. Let me switch around the screen. There we go. All right, so let's go ahead and get on in there. Oh, I love this car. Look at that. Oh, boy. Yeah, so very sparse dash. That is how they cut costs and made this such an affordable machine. Now, you know what's also nice about cutting out the frills? It also cut down the weight. And less weight is kind of one of those key mottos. For instance, you know, Colin Chapman with Lotus simplify and then add lightness well that is the essence of what the speedster was trying to accomplish so by removing all these frills porsche was actually able to sell the speedster for under three thousand two thousand nine hundred and ninety five to be exact and immediately the speedster became a hit at scca events so much so that with the first year of production of the speedster they produced 200 the second year, just to keep up with demand, they produced over a thousand. All right, now it wouldn't be until 1956 that would, we would see any kind of real revision on the Speedster. And in 1956, they would move the engine size up to 1600 cc's. Now, really, it's 1582, but you know, they just round up for purposes, just like the Austin Healey 3000. Well, by all means, let's go ahead and talk about what is powering this fantastic automotive, huh? Let's. So this has the 1582cc, or aka 1600cc, air-cooled overhead valve horizontally opposing four-cylinder engine that can produce about 75 horsepower. Now, the Speedsters made after September of 1957 have the really desirable T2 body style, which is what this one has. Now, the Speedster would really hit its peak regarding production in 1957, and I think it was around 1,400, a little over 1,400. And then in August of 1958, production of the Speedster would would end with the creation of the 356 convertible D. All right, guys, so I can't help it. I am as sentimental as a hen, and we've had this Speedster in the family for over 30 years. There's this wonderful photo of when my dad first bought it and brought it into our mechanic shop, shook and prizes, and my mom is just massively pregnant with my sister, Kalia, and it's just very sweet. And for us, cars have been entwined in our childhood, <laughs> teenage years, and adulthood. And uh, it just, you know, I just love them. And this one is, without a doubt, a beloved favorite of my father's. The Speedster and the AC Cobra are probably his two, were his dream cars. And I'm happy that he has had the opportunity to own them. Oh my gosh, I'm so sappy. I'm so sappy. Now, all right, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed yourself. I got a little sappy there at the end. I'm not going to lie. Huh? I do that. I can't help myself when I'm talking about these beloved pieces of metal. You know what I mean? So it is what it is. 
Now, let's say you enjoy these kind of car videos, well then go ahead and press the subscribe button. And um, elsewise, everybody have a wonderful day. Okay.